you start the semi freddo you need to whisk 300 millilitres of double cream but I have to say they do sell it in cartons of 284 so I wouldn't worry about the <laughs> missing 16 millilitres. So honey semi freddo so I get my honey in 100 mils good runny honey look beautiful one egg and four yolks and I use these beautiful orange yolked Italian eggs which means that the semi freddo will have sort of a deeper intensity but don't worry if you use ordinary eggs and it's paler it'll still taste lovely and last one now this is a very straightforward contraption a pan with a bit of water at the bottom and this bowl suspended over it so that I'm going to heat the honey and eggs without actually letting the water touch them so they were not going to split or anything I just want it to warm not get so hot that we have scrambled eggs I mean of course you could use one of those handheld electric mixers but I want nothing to rupture my three mood. I happen to love a semi freddo more I think than ordinary ice cream I love that melting texture rather than that teeth aching sharpness but one of the fabulous things about it is that it's much easier to make than ice cream just three ingredients and some whisking unlike ice cream you're not making a custard first and you're not churning it once it's freezing or taking it out of the deep freeze and mixing it up now this is just how I want it beautifully yellow and moussely aerated and voluptuously swelling so it's just a question taking it off the heat and folding it into the cream mixture and that's really really all there is to this mm, beautiful and fold in don't worry about this just keep calm and gentle there Now this is frozen in a loaf tin, not like an ice cream, but more like, a, I suppose, like a terrine. And uh, already lined with cling film. And there it is in all its beautiful, pale, honeyed creaminess. Right, this does need to be covered with a bit more cling film. And then put in the deep freeze for about three hours till it's ready to serve. But if it makes your life easier, you can leave it in the freezer for up to two days. And I love to eat this unmolded, then sliced and drizzled with some more fabulous amber honey. And just to complete that resiny taste, sprinkle with some toasted pine nuts. Mm. This is a fabulously easy pudding to make. Passion fruit and white chocolate mousse. I sometimes find white chocolate just a bit too sicky, but the tang of passion fruit really undercuts it. You need three ingredients only, the fruit, the chocolate and eggs. I mean, I've got some raspberries because I love eating the raspberries with it, but you don't have to. Now, I know I kind of foolishly boasted that I traveled light, but not that light, because I want to whisk the whites for the mousse a little bit of heavier equipment now obviously you don't really need this to whisk egg whites but i am a creature of habit six eggs which need to be beaten separately and i always find there's something incredibly satisfying about following a recipe that uses a whole packet of eggs now why and there are 300 grams of chocolate there that's three bars 10 passion fruit, pulp, seeds and all. And as you can see, two punnets of raspberries. So 
while the eggs are whisking, I'm going to mix the chocolate, passion fruit and yolks together and then I can just fold these in when they're stiff. first bit of egg white, it just makes everything easier to mix later. In other words, don't fold, just stir in briskly. See, just fish them about. Now, in a few dollops. I love the way the air bubbles up, as if this mousse has got a life of its own. It's marginally easier to fill the glasses if you pour from a jug. So, just get this in here. Okay, and we're ready to roll. I like to put a few raspberries in the bottom of each of those glasses and then pour the mousse on top. And something very strange happens when it sets, which takes about two or three hours in the fridge. It's as if the passion fruit liquid seeps through the mousse and souses the berries. And then on top you have this light layer of fruity chocolate mousse. associated that American cocktail, a mint julep, with the deepest heat of midsummer. I suppose that's because at a formative age I read The Great Gatsby and in it there is this pivotal scene when they're all sitting around deranged in the airless heat drinking mint juleps before, you know, everything happens. And I've used the ingredients for mint julep to mint and bourbon whiskey to form a syrup for poaching peaches in, which is fabulous for giving deep southern heat to unseasonable fruit. I'm just going to turn this gorgeously aromatic syrup down to simmer and then the peaches that are to be poached in that syrup can be cut. I wouldn't normally advise cooking fruit because fresh fruit is fabulous but it's not very often even the height of summer that you can get a peach you can really sink your teeth into and there's something about poaching peaches that just seems to restore to even resistant and firm flesh all the lusciousness which is due to the peachy estate. If the peaches are at all unripe, and odds on they will be, then it's much easier to remove the stones after they've poached for a while in the pan than it is to do it now. The reason I choose white fleshed rather than yellow fleshed peaches is straightforward. They're more beautiful. I mean, look, this lovely pale flesh and that rosy blush around the rim. And the lovely thing is, when the peaches have been poached and you just slip off the skins, all that beautiful pink-red glow will have transferred onto the pale flesh. They're like fairy tale peaches. So cut side down, in they go. So the peaches are in. Now there's a reason why I use bourbon. Well, obviously it's because it's the key ingredient in a mint julep. But also, I just love the rounded spiciness of bourbon, which scotch doesn't quite have. But if you've only got scotch in the house, that's fine. Not red wine, simply because that would stain them and dye them, and you'd lose all that beautiful paleness. I love the way the peaches seem to ooze their pinkness into the syrup, and then the syrup oozes back 
its bourbon spiciness and it works perfectly. You don't need to make this up from scratch every time. You can let this cool after you've used it and then freeze it. And then next time you want to make these, you've already got your syrup there. But I have to say, a really fabulous way of using this up is to boil it down so you have an intensely peachy bourbon syrup and then pour it hot over cold, cold vanilla ice cream. Mm. I'm going to turn these over now and you'll see why I cook them cut side down first because now they're cut side up which means when I want to test them to see whether they're ready which I do in a very primitive fashion by spearing with a fork it means at least I'm not going to mar their blushing humpbacked beauty. When they're cooked they should feel tender but not flabby and it's hard to be precise to say exactly how long this will take. When they're on the cusp of ripeness maybe a minute or so each side should do it but when they're really firm and underripe you could go as far as four minutes aside. So, just take these lovely little babies out. Ah, oh, like fairy tale peaches. What I love about poaching peaches like this is that you get that hit of intensely fruity midsummer whenever you want, because you can buy peaches really all the year round. And since this takes all the winteriness out of them, it's fabulous. Summer restored. So let these cool a bit before I start manhandling them. And what I want in the syrup is for it to be even more intense. So this means hiving off some, like 200 millilitres, into another pan. Add a splosh more bourbon. And then let this bubble away, getting deeper in taste and colour and thicker. And then when this is cooled, you can pour it over the beautiful skinned peaches, dot with roughly torn up mint and just eat and taste the whole of summer.